One of the oldest religions in the world is Jainism, or traditionally known as Jain Dharma. Originating from ancient India, this philosophy centers around concepts such as right perception, right knowledge, and right conduct in the attainment of moksha, or realization of the soul's true nature. The concept of ahimsa, or non-violence, is of equally great importance. Thus, with compassion for all life, practitioners of Jainism follow a pure vegetarian or vegan diet. Jains follow the ancient wisdom of the 24 Tirthankaras, or prophets, whose teachings comprise the Agam Sutras, the religion's holy scriptures. Lord Mahavira, who is considered to be the last Tirthankara, was born around 5th to 6th century BCE as a prince of the ancient kingdom of Vaishali. He later forsook his royal status to pursue the spiritual path. After attaining Kaval Janan, or all-knowing intuitive vision, he spent the rest of his life giving discourses on spiritual truths, which form the present-day tenets of Jainism. We present to you today excerpts of the first lecture from the second book of Jainism's Akaranga Sutra, entitled, Begging of Food. Begging of Food 2 First Lesson when a male or a female mendicant, having entered the abode of a householder with the intention of collecting alms, recognizes food, drink, dainties, and spices as affected by or mixed up with living beings, mildew, seeds, or sprouts, or wet with water, or covered with dust, either in the hand or the pot of another, they should not, even if they can get it, accept of such food thinking that it is impure and unacceptable. But if perchance they accept of such food under pressing circumstances, they should go to a secluded spot, a garden, or a monk's hall, where there are no eggs, nor living beings, nor sprouts, nor dew, nor water, nor ants, nor mildew, nor drops of water, nor mud, nor cobwebs, and rejecting that which is affected by and cleaning that which is mixed up with living beings, etc., they should circumspectly eat or drink it. But with what they cannot eat or drink, they should resort to a secluded spot and leave it there on a heap of ashes or rusty things or chaff or on any such like place which they have repeatedly examined and cleaned. A monk or a nun on a begging tour should not accept as alms whatever herbs they recognize on examining them as still whole containing their source of life, not split longwise or broadwise, and still alive, fresh beans, living and not broken, for such food is impure and unacceptable. But when they recognize after examination that those herbs are no more whole, do not contain their source of life, are split longwise or broadwise, and no more alive, fresh beans, lifeless and broken, then they may accept them, if they get them, for they are pure and acceptable. A monk or nun on a begging tour should not accept as arms whatever flattened grains, grains containing much chaff or half-roasted spikes of wheat, etc., or flour of wheat, etc., or rice or flour of rice. They recognize as only once worked, for such food is impure and unacceptable. But when they recognize these things as more than once worked, as twice, thrice worked, then they may accept them if they get them, for they are pure and acceptable. A monk or a nun desiring to enter the abode of a householder for collecting alms should not enter or leave it together with a householder or a monk who avoids all forbidden food, etc., together with one who does not. A monk or a nun entering or leaving the out-of-door places for religious practices or for study should not do so together with a householder or a monk who avoids all forbidden food together with one who does not. A monk or a nun wandering from village to village should not do so together with a householder or a monk who avoids all forbidden food together with one who does not. A monk or a nun on a begging tour should not accept food, etc., from a householder whom they know to give out of respect for a negranta, one who is freed from all ties, on behalf of a fellow ascetic. 
food, etc., which he has stolen or taken, though it was not to be taken nor given, but was taken by force, by acting sinfully towards all sorts of living beings, for such like food, etc., prepared by another man or by the giver himself, brought out of the house or not brought out of the house, belonging to the giver or not belonging to him, partaken or tasted of or not partaken or tasted of, is impure and unacceptable. In this precept, substitute for, on behalf of one fellow ascetic, on behalf of many fellow ascetics, on behalf of one female fellow ascetic, on behalf of many female fellow ascetics, so that there will be four analogous precepts. A monk or a nun should not accept of food, etc., which they know has been prepared by the householder for the sake of many shramanas, or a wandering monk, and brahmanas, or member of a cultural and social elite, guests, paupers, and beggars, after he has counted them, acting sinfully towards all sorts of living beings. For such food, whether it be tasted of or not, is impure and unacceptable. This certainly is the whole duty of a monk or a nun in which one should, instructed in all its meanings and endowed with bliss, always exert oneself. Thus I say. Second lesson. A monk or a nun on a begging tour should not accept food, etc. In the following case, when on the eighth or Paushada day, a fasting day, on the beginning of a fortnight, of a month, of two, three, four, five, or six months, or on the days of the seasons, of the junction of the seasons, of the intervals of the seasons. Many Shramanas, wandering monks, and Brahmanas, members of a cultural and social elite, guests, paupers, and beggars are entertained with food, etc., out of one or two or three or four vessels, pots, baskets, or heaps of food such like food, which has been prepared by the giver, etc., all down to, not tasted of, is impure and unacceptable. But if it is prepared by another person, etc., one may accept it, for it is pure and acceptable. A monk or a nun on a begging tour may accept food, etc., from unblamed, uncensured families, to wit, noble families, distinguished families, royal families, families belonging to the line of Ikshvaku, or the first king to implement the Manushmriti, of Hari, or Vishnu and Krishna, cowherds families, Vaishya, or the third of four Hindu social categories families, barbers families, carpenters families, talkers or non-ruling noblemen families, weavers families, for such food, etc., is pure and acceptable. A monk or a nun on a begging tour should not accept food, etc., in the following case, when in assemblies or during offerings to the mains, deceased ancestors, or on a festival of Indra or Skanda, a Hindu deity, or Rudra, a Rigvedic deity, or Mukundra, the supreme personality of Godhead, or demons, or yakshas, nature spirits, or the snakes, or on a festival in honor of a tomb, or a shrine, or a tree, or a hill, or a cave, or a well, or a tank, or a pond, or a river, or a lake, or the sea, when on such like various festivals, many Sramanas, wandering monks, and Brahmanas, members of a cultural and social elite, guests, paupers, and beggars, are entertained with food, etc. But when he perceives that all have received their due share, and are enjoying their meal, he should address the householder's wife or sister or daughter-in-law or nurse or male or female servant and say, O long-lived one, or O sister, will you give me something to eat? After these words of the mendicant, the other may bring forth food, etc., and give it him. Such food, etc., whether he begs for it or the other give it, he may accept, for it is pure and acceptable. When a monk or a nun knows that at a distance of more than half a yogana, or a Vedic measure of distance used in ancient India, a festive entertainment is going on, they should not resolve to go there for the sake of the festive entertainment. 
When a monk hears that the entertainment is given in an eastern or western or southern or northern place, he should go respectfully to the west or east or north or south, being quite indifferent about the feast, wherever there is a festive entertainment in a village or scot-free town, etc., he should not go there for the sake of the festive entertainment. The Kavalin, one who has attained omniscience, assigns as the reason for this precept that if the monk eats food, etc., which has been given him on such an occasion, he will incur the sin of one who uses what has been prepared for him or is mixed up with living beings or has been bought or stolen or taken, though it was not to be taken, nor was it given, but taken by force. A layman might, for the sake of a mendicant, make small doors large or large ones small, put beds from a level position into a sloping one or from a sloping position into a level one, place the beds out of the draft or in the draft, cutting and clipping the grass outside or within the upashraya or a building meant for stay of white robe ascetics, spread a couch for him, thinking that this mendicant is without means for a bed. Therefore, should a well-controlled near grantha or one who is freed from all ties not resolve to go to any festival which is preceded or followed by a feast? This certainly is the whole duty, etc. Thus I say, Third lesson. When he has eaten or drunk at a festive entertainment, he might vomit what he has eaten, or not well digested, or some other bad disease or sickness might befall him. The Kavalin, one who has attained omniscience, says this is the reason. A mendicant, having drunk various liquors, together with the householder or his wife, monks or nuns, might not find the promised resting place on leaving the scene of entertainment and looking out for it, or in the resting place he may get into mixed company. In the absence of his mind or in his drunkenness, he may lust after a woman or a eunuch. Approaching the mendicant, they will say, O long-lived Sramana, a wandering monk, let us meet in the garden or in the sleeping place, in the night or in the twilight. He might go to her, though he knows it should not be done. These are the causes to sin. They multiply continuously. Therefore, should a well-controlled Nergrantha, or one who is freed from all ties, not resolve to go to any festival which is preceded or followed by a feast. A monk or a nun, hearing or being told of some festivity, might hasten there, rejoicing inwardly. There will be an entertainment, sure enough. It is impossible to get there from other families' alms which are acceptable and given out of respect for the cloth and to eat the meal. As this would lead to sin, they should not do it. But they should enter there, and getting from other families their alms, should eat their meal. A monk or a nun, knowing that in a village or a scot-free town, etc., an entertainment will be given, should not resolve to go to that village, etc., for the sake of the entertainment. The Kavalin, one who has attained omniscience, assigns the reason herefor. When a man goes to a much frequented and vulgar entertainment, somebody's foot treads on his foot, somebody's hand moves his hand, somebody's bowl clashes against his bowl, somebody's head comes in collision with his head, somebody's body pushes his body, or somebody beats him with a stick or a fist or a clod, or sprinkles him with cold water, or covers him with dust, or he eats unacceptable food, or he receives what should be given to others. Therefore should a well-controlled near Granta, one who is freed from all ties, not resolve to go to a much frequented and vulgar entertainment to partake of it. We enjoyed your company for today's episode of Between Master and Disciples. Join us again next Thursday for part two of the excerpts of Begging of Food from the Jainism's Akaranga Sutra. Now, please stay tuned to Supreme Master Television for Animal World, our co-inhabitants. Up next, right after Noteworthy News. May heaven's blessings fill your life with happiness, love, and harmony. For more details, please visit www.suprememastertv.com. 
forward slash BMD.